my name is Deborah Barnes. I'm from the Association of Jewish Refugees. Nice to see some familiar faces here today. But for anyone not familiar with the AJR, we are the national charity supporting Britain's Jewish refugees um, and survivors of Nazi oppression. And we are committed to the education of others about the Holocaust. For more information about what we do, please go to our website and we're also on Twitter and Facebook. We're delighted to welcome Eva and Gabby here today to discuss descendants of the Holocaust 75 years after liberation. Dr. Eva Fogelman is a psychologist in private practice in New York City and co-director of Child Development Research, which includes the international study of organized persecution of children. She is a pioneer in developing therapeutic techniques for generations of the Holocaust and related historical traumas and training mental health professionals. She was co-founder co and co-director of Psychotherapy with Generations of the Holocaust and Related Traumas at the Training Institute for Mental Health and founding director of the Jewish Foundation for Christian Rescuers. Dr. Fogelman is the writer and co-producer of the award-winning documentary, Breaking the Silence, The Generation After the Holocaust. Her book, Conscience and Courage, Rescuers of Jews During the Holocaust, is a Pulitzer Prize nominee. In addition to other books, her writings appear in professional and popular publications. Dr. Fogelman serves on many boards and is an advisor to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. She's a frequent consultant and speaker nationally and internationally, as well as in the media. Gabby Glassman is a psychologist and psychotherapist in practice, private practice in London. Since 1989, she has conducted in London many second generation groups for children of Holocaust survivors and refugees and has also facilitated second generation groups in Berlin and Prague over many years. She has had articles published internationally on the transgenerational transmission of trauma. Gabby is a patron of the Raphael Institute in Prague and a trustee of the Association of Jewish Refugees. She co-founded the Survivor Centre and the Second Generation Network in the UK. Gabby is the daughter of Holocaust survivors and grew up in Holland. Welcome to both Gabby and Eva, and thank you for joining us today. I'm going to mute myself now and hand over to our speakers. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you, AJR, for inviting me. And hello to everyone. I think uh, Eva and I first met about 30 years ago in Jerusalem at the first second generation conference. Uh, and that was the uh, first second generation conference ever. Um, Eva, could you say something now about uh, how the second generation, how that came about, why there was a conference uh, then at that time? Sure. Uh, I am, uh, I'm from New York and in the, uh, the uh, early mid 1970s, there was a tremendous movement of uh, the women's movement, the black movement. Uh, we had a TV series called Roots that was done by Haley that was watched by millions and millions of people. So that it was a time in American society when individuals were beginning to think about their own personal identity. And there were a group of children of Holocaust survivors, amongst them one of my uh, very dear friends, Dina Rosenfeld, that put together a, um, a journal. There was a contemporary Jewish review called Response. And um, children of survivors got together in a group and spoke about how the Holocaust impacted them. We're talking about 1975 now. And, uh, and then there were some writings by children of survivors. And it is that a particular dialogue that myself and my colleague Bella Saverin, uh, we were both in a Jewish women's group together in Boston at the time, we saw that as, aha, this is a group for children of survivors. 
And so we approached one of the rabbis, Joe Pollack, at uh, Boston University, if we can lead a group for children of Holocaust survivors. One other thing that was happening at that time is that Elie Wiesel started teaching the Holocaust at Boston University. And it turned out that Joe Pollack had been a child survivor from Holland who had been in uh, Bergen-Belsen. And so he too went, ha ha, this is great. And we started advertising in Jewish bookstores. We put up posters all over the Boston University campus, awareness group for children of Holocaust survivors. And indeed, we had two groups uh, that spring of 1976. After having done the groups, we realized that this is really just the beginning. The children of survivors really need a greater amount of people to meet with in order to do the personal mourning that each has to do. But at the same time, it is really a collective mourning that indeed we are all going through. And so uh, myself, Bella Savrin, and Moshe Waldox, who has since become a rabbi and a book, uh, a man who wrote a book on uh, Jewish humor. We went to Rabbi Yitz Greenberg because he had an organization in New York that had a Holocaust center. And we said, we'd like to do a conference. And he didn't have time. He didn't have money at the time. And uh, a lot of things intervened. And in, uh, what happened is that in uh, June, 19th of 1977, Helen Epstein wrote an article, Heirs of the Holocaust. It was read by more than 2 million people. It had uh, writing, it had interviews with children of Holocaust survivors, and the groups that Bella Savrin and I were leading were also highlighted in the group. And there were others who began to um, to follow, uh, to begin these groups in, uh, in Detroit, in, in California. And in 1979, oh, in, in 1979, the spring of 79, Helen Epstein's book, Children of the Holocaust, Conversation with Sons and Daughters of Survivors, began. So one of the, the so these two uh, writings were very seminal in terms of a movement that was created for children of survivors. Before a movement, it was an identity. Children of Holocaust survivors obviously always knew that their parents had gone through the Holocaust. They might not have known everything that their parents went through, and most did not. They only knew bits and pieces of the story. But it gave them an identity in terms of feeling, indeed, they are not the only ones who felt different from, say, their, you know, their American Jewish peers. Their homes during the holiday had uh, memorial candles there. People spoke about who was not there to celebrate with them for, for the holiday. I see Barbara there shaking you know, her head. And so children of survivors felt what they went through, gee, you know, this is not so crazy after all. And uh, because other people are experiencing it. So in 1979, November, uh, I, I helped organize the uh, first conference on children of Holocaust survivors in New York. We had 600 children of survivors come. And from that, a lot of groups began. Uh, some were the awareness groups, some were self-help groups, and also organizations for children of Holocaust survivors. And... Um, and then what continued the momentum of, uh, of the identity of being a child of survivors and the movement is that in 1981, we had the World Gathering of Holocaust Survivors in Jerusalem, in which I believe there were about 5,000 people, uh, survivors, their children came from all over the world. There were 1,000 children of Holocaust survivors we came, and we had our own meeting for the whole day and at the end of it, we had a proclamation uh, that was read at the, uh, at the Kotel, the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, that we children of Holocaust survivors will take on the responsibility to commemorate and to educate uh, the next generation. And uh, moving along in terms of what happened in America, and that I have to tell you is that that particular event gave Holocaust survivors back their dignity. Before that, everybody saw them as victims. 
And finally, people were beginning to see the survivors, not as victims, but as, as, as individuals who survived and who thrived and who've contributed to all the societies that they lived in. And obviously, most importantly, in Israel. Sorry for getting so emotional about all of this. Um, um, moving on is that in 1981, we had a, uh, an American gathering in which 10,000 Holocaust survivors and their children came. And again, we had our own program. By that time, we already had, this is 1983. So by that time, we already had an international network of children of Holocaust survivors who met quite, uh, quite regularly. Uh, and, uh, we, and people had different agendas of what they were thinking about in terms of doing with their identity. Some people were more interested in the psychosocial issues of wanting to, uh, to explore how their parents' experience has affected them. Other people were more interested in, in political issues and you know, wanting to still try to capture whatever Nazis were uh, available. Uh, Menachem Rosasaf was one of the people who led many of the political actions we had. One of them was going to, um, to Bergen-Belsen when President Reagan went, uh, equated Bitburg and Bergen-Belsen. And uh, Menachem coordinated a group of us from uh, the United States and from Germany who protested the equation of uh, the Waffen-SS uh, who were buried in Bitburg and the Jews who were murdered in um, in Bergen uh, in in Bergen Belsen, and um, so here we are. We're now up to uh, 1980, uh, 1985, and then you can see. And then Gabi talks about uh, after we uh, 1985, we had a conference for children of survivors in New York. Through the international network, we had 1,600 children of Holocaust survivors come from all over. And so we wanted to have the next conference in Israel. And this is where Gabi, um, Gabi and I uh, met. So with that, um, I, will, um, I will ask Gabi what it was like for, for the, um, for the uh, uh, children of survivors in England. I will say one thing, though, is that in... Um, in 1978, I was invited to Israel uh, to work with the late uh, Dr. Hillel Klein, who was the uh, president, of, who was uh, president of the Psychoanalytic Society there. I did the first group for children of Holocaust survivors at Hebrew University. And this is in 1978, I was told I was bringing an American phenomenon to Israel. Children of Holocaust survivors in Israel were not affected by the Holocaust. They all felt a sense of, you know, belonging, and uh, it wasn't an issue for them. And indeed, the group that I led at Hebrew University only had one authentic Israeli. Everybody else was from uh, South America and Australia and uh, America. So that it wasn't in Israel until uh, 1988 when Amcha then began to reach out that uh, children of survivors began to realize, yes, they belong to Israeli society, but what happened at home and how that affected them in terms of their identity, in terms of their relationship with their parents, indeed did have, a, uh, did have an effect. So Gabi, what was it like for children of Holocaust survivors in, in England? Uh, well, uh, I've always felt that here things started uh, about 10 years later, but listening to you, uh, we are actually falling behind even more because uh, in, in England, the uh, pivotal moment was the Maxwell Conference in 1988, in the summer of 1988. And I remember that uh, as a result of that, we uh, could put uh, flyers out and people could uh, put their name down for a second generation group. So uh, a colleague and I started uh, then running second generation groups the next uh, after year. So some of 1989. Uh, and I, I should just point out that there is a difference in the survival population uh, in the States and elsewhere and the UK because in the UK uh, the uh, survival population 
uh, consists mostly of uh, refugees. About 70,000 came over to uh, this country and uh, only about 2,000 survivors. Well, that was the traditional figure that was always mentioned. And um, so refugees um, uh, came over and, and settled here. And of course, uh, many of the families were left behind. And you may be surprised uh, to think of uh, refugees also as uh, first generation Holocaust survivors. Um, but and in the beginning, uh, they were not considered Holocaust survivors and there was a kind of hierarchy of suffering that uh, Holocaust survivors uh, were allowed to talk about these things and refugees well, well, were you, not. Right, you bring, up, you bring up a very important point and that is who is a Holocaust survivor and by that, by then that means, you know, who is a child of Holocaust survivors? And exactly. so I'd like to say I'd like to say something about that because we have to remember that in 1953 uh, the German government started giving uh, reparations, and their criteria was that anybody who was in a concentration camp or in a ghetto for 18 months was considered a Holocaust survivor, which meant that that really left out a lot of people. If we're talking about Hungary, for example, the Germans didn't march into Hungary until March of 1944. So there weren't 18 months that people could have been in a ghetto or in a concentration camp. Uh, and um, so that began, so children of Holocaust survivors, like you say, those who, uh, whose parents left before, who considered themselves refugees, say, well, I'm not really a child of Holocaust survivors. My parents were really refugees. And I would say that there was the same, very similar kind of feeling in the United States. As those who were children during the Holocaust, they didn't receive any reparations. When they tried to get reparations, the German governments, even if they had been in a camp or in a ghetto, the German government said, well, you were too young to remember. They would ask them questions. Obviously, they didn't remember. Uh, they said, well, if you don't remember, then you, po you couldn't have possibly been affected by it. But a lot has changed over the years uh, in terms of what the German government is giving reparations to and how uh, the children of Holocaust survivors are beginning to, um, to uh, identify themselves and realizing that, it, that we don't need this hierarchy of suffering. You know, if you were in a camp or if you were in a ghetto, or if you were hiding or escaping or had false identification papers. And so what we have today is today, I would say that we have a much broader definition of who is a child of Holocaust survivors. And that's in, in Germany, anybody who lived from January 30th, 1933, when Hitler became chancellor, uh, is considered a Holocaust survivor. In Austria, anybody who was there during you know, the Anschluss is a Holocaust survivor. So that every country is different depending on when the Germans invaded that particular uh, country. And in Germany, obviously, it's you know, when the Third Reich began. And you know, if we just take a look at the history of you know, what had happened to the Jews in Germany, which I won't go into right now, you will see you know, that some indeed were incarcerated and, and people lost their jobs and people even had to hide out then. And people who tried to escape you know, had tremendous difficulties going from country. So we can't possibly, so let's forget about this hierarchy of suffering of those uh, you know, who were in a camp or those who were in a ghetto. Anybody who lived under that German, uh, it was a nightmare. Yeah, and every suffering is different and only the person themselves, of course, uh, can know what that suffering is like and we should not make a judgment. But uh, for instance, in the second generation groups that I've been running, the uh, children of refugees uh, often felt at the beginning, in the opening round, uh, that they hadn't suffered enough and uh, they shouldn't be in a group if, if for instance, in the, in the introduction, they had to uh, say that, own up to only being a child of refugee, as it were, if they had just spoken after uh, a child of survivors. And uh, the same for uh, children of survivors, they felt uh, 
that uh, children of refugees didn't know really what real suffering uh, right. was. And so it was very important to address this and uh, for everyone to recognize everyone else and uh, the validity of their presence in the group. So the group have, groups have always been mixed and it has worked very well. Uh, but in a way, the groups, what happened, the, the dynamic about that hierarchy uh, that replicated what was also happening in the survivor and refugee community, that, that um, refugees weren't allowed to talk about any subject in relation to the Holocaust. Right. And, and the, the conflict about it has uh, hopefully died down now, but there were some very uh, strongly worded letters in the press about it, and it did go on for some years, I believe. I will say, you know, one thing, one thing that has disturbed me, and I don't know if some of you have also experienced it, is if a Holocaust survivor married a non-Jew, and particularly if they married a German after the Holocaust, in some cases they converted, in other cases they didn't, that children of Holocaust survivors who had two Jewish parents very often resented those whose parents maybe did not uh, marry Jews and, and almost said, you don't belong here. And, uh, and that too was a, a, a category that I was certainly not very, very, uh, very happy with as well. So I, I, maybe we need to move our conversation a little yep. bit about, you know, what it was like for children of Holocaust survivors to, you know, to grow up with, with, uh, with parents and how uh, these homes were and the relationships at home were different from those of, you know, uh, British people, British Jews who were there before, and obviously uh, American Jews who were there before. Yeah, so uh, of course, uh, uh, survivor families were so often characterized by silence that parents didn't talk about uh, the Holocaust and uh, that somehow, you know, the subject was avoided at all costs and yet children uh, sense that there was something very different and uh, some will say that they have known all their lives that uh, there was something uh, different but it, it was not always named and, um, and so the silence has been uh, the cause of a lot of damage and, uh, and yet parents they, they try to do their best they try to protect their children and uh, children uh, wanted to protect their parents. They didn't want to hurt their parents even more because they knew their parents had suffered so much. And children uh, therefore also were afraid to ask questions. And there, were, uh, there was a conspiracy of silence, as it's so often referred to, in families. And yet uh, yes. parents may have had nightmares and um, secret conversations. Children uh, overheard a lot. And um, also some grandchildren uh, overheard conversations. Hello. I managed to get the sound. Yes. And I'm not quite sure. Uh, Hello? I would... I... Can you still hear me? We hear you just fine. Oh, because uh, the picture sort of disappeared. Okay. okay um, oh, um, so there, there was this mutual uh, protection, and um, the interesting thing is that from children having wanted to protect their their parents, they then later on also protected their uh, friends and their partners and people at work. Uh, they found it very difficult to say no, and um, and I'm talking about the children I've seen in my practice and in the group. Right. Um, I would think you also experienced that. Yeah, I would say that uh, in most families, children of Holocaust survivors heard bits and pieces of the parents' experience, but they didn't really have a narrative of the whole uh, experience. And very often that did not happen until children of survivors began to interview their parents when they, when they were in their 20s, their 30s, and, and their, in their 60s. Um, and there were some families, again, not that many families, but some families uh, where there was in, uh, 
constant talk about the Holocaust for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And, and that, by the way, when children of Holocaust survivors heard uh, the horrors at a very young age or heard them constantly, one of the feelings that it brought out in children of survivors is tremendous amount of uh, anger. And then uh, today we discovered there are, there are a few, not many, uh, children of Holocaust survivors where their parents totally denied uh, their, um, uh, their past and never even told their children they were Holocaust survivors. Um, uh, Marissa uh, uh, Bevelacqua Fox is now doing a film called My Underground Mother, where she discovered that indeed her mother had been in a, uh, in a women's labor camp in Gobbensdorf, and she did not know it till many years after her mother had died. Helen Fremont just, uh, she's come out with two books about her experiences of growing up as a, uh, as a Christian in upstate New York, and then finding out that she was Jewish. So that so some of the communication was, you know, total denial and children of survivors in their 50s and 60s, uh, some in their 20s found out. And, uh, and in Eastern Europe, by the way, this was something that was very common. Many children of survivors in, in Eastern Europe thought they, their parents would say, you know, I was a communist. So I was in Auschwitz because I was a communist, not because they were Jewish. And then one day, a kid comes home and says, oh, somebody called me a Jude. What, what is a Jude? And then they said, well, you know, you're one of them. And that's how many children of survivors found out. And I don't know how many, uh, how many uh, children of survivors today um, are in England from uh, after Glasnost. Um, and uh, certainly in America, we have quite a few children of survivors who you know, only recently found out that they were Jews when they were beginning to uh, to come to uh, to leave, uh, you know, former republics of the Soviet Union or Czechoslovakia, Romania, and they too are just beginning to deal with these issues. Yes, uh, here too, uh, there, I think there's been a, a new influx of, of children trying to find out, um, you know, who, who they are are where they come from who didn't know uh, very much and who were who uh, still to this day are completely new to the whole topic of you know what is uh, special about being second generation and in, in what right. way is second generation different and, yeah. uh, and and then recognizing that others have struggled with similar issues uh, as they have had uh, yeah. has been very comforting for them because uh, children of survivors they often uh, they so often blame themselves though they don't really know what they've done wrong but all their lives they try to get unconditional love and, um, and uh, some parents didn't have that available to give uh, it was too suppressed and um, so uh, one uh, person said my mother doesn't do love, and, and I think that describes it at all, uh, how, how uh, that person felt. You know, I well, found you know, one of the things we have to, one of the things we have to remember about, you know, uh, about post-traumatic stress disorder that the Holocaust survivors experienced, even though um, when, we, when we think about the, the mental well-being of Holocaust survivors, we are always quite amazed about the resilience of these people who experience such massive psychic trauma. But one of the, uh, for some of the survivors, one of the remnants of that is, you know, this feeling of, of numbness. One of the ways in which they were able to survive uh, the persecution that they did and living from minute to minute as if they were going to die is to become totally psychologically uh, numb. And sometimes that feeling uh, of feeling of being a little more open with your feelings uh, never came never came back. But I would say, if anything, we think about Holocaust survivors who were so elated to you know to have children. And, and, and the hope that it gave them that life was going to go on, that, um, 
that I would say that for the, for the majority of them, there was this tremendous feeling of, uh, of, of love in the family. And at times it was even a little too, too much and that it was very difficult for Holocaust survivors to separate from their children when they, you know, when they had to go to college or if they had to, um, if they had to get married because people, Holocaust survivors, for, we have to remember for Holocaust survivors, any form of separation meant death. And so just thinking about that, um, that a child is gonna go off and who knows when, and. God forbid, who knows when they're going to see them again, uh, and if they will see them again, brought up a lot of fears. But I just want to say one thing about the psychological research, because there's been a lot of research about the separation, individuation of children of Holocaust survivors. And the reality is that um, sometimes children of Holocaust survivors may take a little longer than others to separate. But I think that we've all done pretty well in separating and individuating and having our own lives and, you know, and going on. Uh, so that even though it might, in some families might have been a difficult time period, everybody else has indeed been able to, uh, to go on and have their, their own lives. I wanted to ask you, Gabby, I about... The, I think the separation, you know, many people have had, uh, therapeutic help they've been able to achieve it now but it has been so hard for them uh, that uh, unless they were uh, able to seek help and, and ready to seek help uh, and and here you have to pay for it uh, by yourself really uh, there are still many who are struggling with that separation uh, from parents which means that they're still living by their parental standards the the things they have internalized from their parents and the parents may uh, long be dead uh, so uh, it's it's not, it hasn't been resolved yet and i i also think that it's often uh, started already in adolescence and that parents uh, find it very difficult for to let, to give children more freedom well, that's why I think that being in a group with other children of Holocaust survivors and talking about these issues is something that is very therapeutic and healing and enables children of survivors to be able to, uh, to, be able to go on, those who avail themselves of the groups when they were, when they were, in, their, uh, when they were in their 20s. I'd like to uh, ask you, Gabi, about uh, the identity of children of Holocaust survivors in, uh, in England, and, and then, of course, the Jewish identity. In the United States, those children of survivors who grew up in the uh, late 40s, the 50s, the 60s, they grew up at a time in American uh, Jewish society when Holocaust survivors were shunned. Uh, the Saturday Evening Post, for example, which was one of the most popular magazines at the time, said that the best people died and those who survived must have done something devious in order to survive. And so this is how Holocaust survivors were looked at. And you can imagine what it was like for a child of Holocaust survivors to have to see their parents in that kind of a, in that kind of a light. And then obviously, as I mentioned, uh, later, the, uh, the dignity that survivors received, and then at the American gathering where uh, President Reagan said, you survivors belong in America, there was then a total shift of, of who Holocaust survivors were in America. And all of a sudden, they began to be invited to, uh, to light candles and to be honored and to have dinners in their honor and to have them come and speak at different organizations and then later on in, in school so that the, uh, the older, that they, well, today they're younger, the younger second generation who, uh, uh, who was living more in the uh, 70s and the 80s, and then certainly the third generation grew up with a different sense about who the Holocaust survivor, and obviously, that had an effect on the on the identity. What was it like in England? Well, in England, I think uh, it's repeated uh, what was happening in America. But then, um, you know, many people had read about being second generation, uh, which was uh, in in 1980 
uh, eight when uh, the um, the first conference took place for uh, survivors it was a new concept still uh, so but as it became uh, more known then uh, yep uh, the positive aspect of uh, being a survivor and therefore also positive aspect of being second generation uh, that that made a big change and yet uh, survivors who then uh, felt much better, particularly those who were able to write their uh, autobiography or who to, uh, were able to speak in schools, they, uh, they worked through what they hadn't been able to work through before, through that process. And yet the children were often uh, too damaged in a way to, to benefit from that whole U-turn about how one uh, perceived how society perceived uh, Holocaust survivors. So for them, it had come too late. The grandchildren benefited, uh, and some children did, but by no means everyone. And and there might also have been some resentment of parents suddenly being so incredibly busy uh, with it, and children feeling left out yet again in a way, like they had felt left out. Of of, and um, what about the, what about the what about the Jewish identity? The the Jewish identity. My my experience is that when children grew up in a Jewish environment, like in Northwest London, uh, with uh, others who were survivors or refugees around, uh, that was of tremendous benefit. Though one didn't speak about it, of course, for many years, but it was there. Uh, many parents did uh, intentionally, I think, settle in the provinces away from any Jewish influence. And uh, that was very hard for children because then uh, they had the Holocaust experience, that negative experience, but they, they were deprived of a positive experience of celebrating Jewish holidays. And the confidence of being a survivor, uh, like um, in America, I, I don't think uh, even to this day it's here, though the survivors who are speaking in schools, they have developed the confidence, but there are many others who, who are still in hiding in a way. Yeah. Well, I would say that uh, America really has the same kind of diversity, number one, that we had in, uh, that the Jews had in Europe. I mean, they were a very diverse kind of group and, and therefore they're very diverse in America. But in some families, uh, some families, obviously some survivors felt, if I survive this, I'm gonna become more religious and obey all the laws and, and raise their children in that kind of a way of a sense of gratitude to, uh, of a sense of gratitude to God. Other uh, people were, uh, other survivors were very uh, angry with God and did not want to uh, have much to do with the organized Jewish community in terms of going to prayer, uh, belonging to a synagogue, and that sort of isolated children of survivors and might not have received a strong sense about being Jew, that being Jewish was much more negative and much more a sense of being a victim rather than being proud of being, uh, being, uh, being Jewish. Uh, some children of survivors felt that by, by immersing themselves in Jewish study and in the texts that were lost, this was a way of saying, you see, Hitler, you didn't win after all. And that the Jewish culture that was destroyed, they were able to, uh, to continue and give that to, uh, to the third and the, uh, and, the fourth, uh, and the fourth generation. It is true that the, that the, um, that the, uh, ultra-Orthodox community, the Hasidic community, uh, the Orthodox community, all, I would say really all the communities were, did not commemorate the Holocaust. And um, there was a, in the, in the uh, religious community, there was a feeling early on in the early years, if we focus on the Holocaust, then who would be interested in any, uh, in identifying as Jews? And in fact, Abraham Joshua Heschel, one of the things that he tried to do in writing the book on the Sabbath 
and some of his other writings, because he himself was a Holocaust survivor, is he said, we have to bring spirituality back to Judaism. And it is that, um, and it, it, it was that kind of an atmosphere of, you know, how do we imbue a sense of spirituality? Let's talk about, you know, is there a God? Isn't there a God? And that's the way to connect to, uh, to Judaism. And, um, and so the religious community did not begin to even have commemorations till, uh, till, much, uh, till much later, much uh, later on. And, um, and amongst the children of survivors, again, we have a really, a really broad range of how children of survivors, those who are, those who are proud of it, those who you know, are staying away from anything Jewish for fear that who knows what is going to, you know, to happen to, uh, what is going to happen to the Jews. Yeah, here, uh, I think children of survivors have often uh, been given very mixed messages. On the one hand, uh, they were sent to Hebrew classes, and on the other hand, uh, their uh, father, mother, uh, would have lost faith in God, and uh, so would have felt, uh, or the children uh, realized that they felt abandoned, the parents felt abandoned by God. So there, there was this conflict and they, they just couldn't understand it. And the people who've come for help have mainly not been religious. I mean, the observant ones, I could count uh, on, on fingers of one hand. And yet I know that in the ultra-Orthodox community uh, in the last few years, uh, they've uh, also address the issues that uh, second generation and maybe third generation too are struggling yeah. with. So it, the work is being done, but, but uh, they are completely separate. Right. I see that we're getting ready for the no. question and answer period. No, I so, so I just want to bring, our discussion has really been more of the past in terms of children of Holocaust survivors. And what I wanted to say just a little bit about the, about the present right now is that we are in a, uh, several things are happening. Uh, one is that children of Holocaust survivors have mourned uh, the experience of mourning people that they never knew. Third generation is involved in similar kind of a, a process. And so when we talk about mourning, we talk about the shock of how we learned and then, you know, the denial of not dealing and not talking to the parents and then the confrontation and then all the feelings that emerge of, you know, the anger and the rage and the sense of helplessness and wanting to undo the parents' pain. And now we are in a, uh, obviously, at any moment, we can go back to those stages if we have had a loss. But what we're seeing now is this faith stage of mourning, which is a search for meaning. And this is where we're seeing a lot of creativity emerging from the second generation, from the third generation. We have many children of Holocaust survivors writing uh, books about their, about their parents. Uh, we have with us today uh, Tommy Schnurmacher, whose mother came from Hungary, a fabulous book, How Vanity Saved Her Life in Auschwitz. Um, and, uh, and we have, as I mentioned earlier, Helen Fremont, who writes about finding out. Uh, we have Helen Epstein, who just came out with a book, Francie, about her. Uh, this was her mother's memoir that she wrote in 1975, and nobody wanted to publish it, and Helen recently found it. And is uh, and the book has just come out, and I believe it's also come out in uh, in England. So we have we have um, we have the revival of uh, the Yiddish theater with Zalman Lotik that has really mushroomed, and one of our uh, the plays uh, Fiddler on the Roof went from being at the Holocaust Museum in New York to going to uh, going to Broadway. It's moving to Australia now, and this is. Again, this was the, you know, the creativity of children of Holocaust survivors who want to do something creative and constructive. Uh, we have formed a, um, a, uh, a face group uh, called 2G Greater New York, where we are promoting these creative works that individuals are doing. Some of you may want to join 2G um, 
Fuji grade in New York, where uh, you can see the, what is happening with the children of survivors. And the other has to do with the fact that, as uh, Gabby was saying, there was a lot of silence. And now children of survivors, even if their parents are deceased, are going to uh, Jewish gen, Jewish genealogy. Uh, and uh, looking for family, people are doing roots trips. Obviously, we're all, you know, in isolation now. So some, so the trips have stopped. But uh, I can tell you that uh, the genealogy uh, searches are continuing all through this uh, this uh, set period of uh, of isolation. Yeah, and, it's uh, it's flourishing here as well. The genealogy, but I. I think that as time is moving on very quickly, we should uh, invite the audience uh, to yeah. ask questions. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Gabby. So I think the best thing, if somebody, if you have a question, if you can go to the um, reactions tab and wave, virtually send a wave. I'm going to do one now so you can see. Um, then that brings attention to me. Or just put it on the chat. Just say question on the chat and we'll come to you um, because um, there's a lot of people to we'll try and scroll through as well if you're physically waving I don't know if we can see any questions let's see anyone waving anyone? yes uh, Pat Pidevardi Barbara Pat Vardy Go ahead. Unmute yourself. Unmute I've yourself. unmuted. I'm asking. Yeah. That's it. Can okay. you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, my name's Pat Varty. I'm the daughter of a Winton. She, my, my mother, Edith Hirsch, was on the Winton list wow. and came to England um, on the train. Um, and I was brought up without knowing I was Jewish or any, knowing any of the Holocaust history. Uh, and it wasn't until an incident happened when I was called a Jewish bitch, because I had a funny name, uh, that uh, I then asked my parents the questions and then it came out. But my mother didn't even know who brought her to England. Uh, she thought it was the Red Cross. And it was only when Nicholas Winton appeared on a television programme that we realised um, that she came on the train, one of the trains in July 39, uh, one of the last ones. And okay. since then, right, I've been... We haven't got much time, so what, what's, what do you want to ask? Um... Well, I just wanted to identify the, with the, uh, the speaker that... Um, a lot of us were brought up in ignorance of our history. And it's only the work of, say, the AJR that's helped to bring that history forward to me and um, by attending some of the events. Right. Okay. Eva or Gabby, you have anything to add? Yeah, to I just wanted to say that uh, it, it seems that most of the, uh, most of the survivors of, uh, of Nicholas Winton did not know who had brought them. And um, so that your experience is not different from others. And I hope what you do is that you get, I don't know if you were at any of the gatherings that, that they had for Winton where they brought together the families. And I hope that one of the things that would be good is for you to meet some of the second generation who were rescued by uh, Nicholas Winton. And yeah. I think that be a very good experience for you. Yeah. In fact, I would maybe meet meet his son or daughter at one of the events because they are uh, both very active too, and that may give you a feeling of being mm. able to thank them. Mm. Okay. I was very fortunate to meet Nicholas Winton in the yeah. Czech Embassy, and I have been involved in a lot of AGR events and actually went to Prague 18 months ago to the station where they put, put him up to the parents of the kinder. Right, by the way, the uh, Aristides okay. de Sousa's Mendes Foundation is having a talk 
uh, where I'm talking in Annette Insdorf about, uh, about Nicholas Winton on Sunday at four o'clock New York time. Uh, if you wanna tune into that, look up uh, Aristides de Souza's Mendes Foundation, and that would be great to have you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to mute you, Pat. Okay, we, we have another question here that's been sent on the chat from Ariana Neumann. Um, Ariana wrote, has written a book and she's going to be in our um, book club next week. I'm going to be talking to her about her book, um, When Time Stopped. Um, and her question is, do you see the differences in the trauma and coping mechanisms of people that grew up within a conspiracy of silence? versus the people that grew up with parents who shared their stories. Shall I read it again? Uh, yes, no, I, got, I, I got I, the would, question. Uh, Gabby. Yeah, Gabby, yeah, I, I, I have found that uh, where family dynamics uh, were not functioning well, that it was so often because uh, parents' mourning had been unresolved and that had um, given the rise to the conspiracy of silence, their, their inability to talk about things. So uh, those who are able to talk or were able to talk about the past, um, unless, well, if they didn't do it excessively and uh, sort of drum it down children's throats, then in those families there was openness and children felt more able to ask questions. It was more normal because it was uh, possible to talk about it. It's like with any kind of taboo. If you don't uh, know what it is, or if you feel you have to circumnavigate uh, the taboo, then that's not healthy for uh, communication. And that spread also, uh, if it wasn't possible to talk about, it uh, spread to anything that was difficult to talk about and families were often divided uh, between sensitive children who uh, were interested in the Holocaust and their siblings who had a sort of hard skin, who, who just didn't want to know, who said they weren't affected. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the way parents were communicating with their children was, was very crucial and there are attachment studies. So if you look up John Bowlby and attachment theory and their specific studies uh, uh, where they have um, looked at uh, the communication between survivor mothers and their infant daughters and they are very interesting and highlight also the inconsistency in the parents in the narrative when a parent hasn't worked through the experience that somehow the, uh, the narrative um, is inconsistent and children who, of course, are only children, they've got to make sense of those inconsistencies, which is impossible to do. Right. Oh, that's interesting. I was just going to add to that, which is that so many things go into the mix of how one was affected by their parents having been Holocaust survivors that, uh, you know, we can't really... Uh, you know, sort out if, you know, the family didn't talk or the family did talk and how did that have an effect? Because there were so many other things that went into the, that went into the mix that um, we can't just think about this one, one dynamic. So Eva, we have another question that has been uh, di directed to you, which is um, related actually, I'm sort of related. So um, Lillian Black's asking, why is it still hard to talk about it to siblings? You mean why the survivors have a hard time talking to their siblings about no, I think, it? I think oh, the second generation. Yeah. Okay. Well, so you have to remember that in every family, there is often one memorial candle, which is one per one of this one of the children is very very interested in the Holocaust and in wanting to commemorate it and and do something constructive and positive with it, whereas the other people could care less, you know? We have to think about, you know, the Passover Seder, right? And when we think about the four sons, we have, we, we have people who are reacting to, you know, the going out of Egypt in very different kinds of ways. 
We have the person who's the wise one. We have the person who's simple, the person who doesn't ask questions, and you know, and the person who doesn't care. And then, um, and then, um, uh, Lord, um, uh, well, what's the rabbi who became a lord? And the British guy. Lord Sachs. Lord Sachs. And Lord Sachs says that, you know, today we have a fifth category that have completely left us so that we can't expect all the siblings in the family to have the same kind of commitment to, uh, to remembering. And uh, it is very difficult for the person who is the memorial candle to be in a family and say, how come that person doesn't care? Why do I care? And sometimes that has to do with who you were named after and, uh, and that you want to, in a way, carry on that name. Uh, sometimes it has to do with the birth order. Those children of Holocaust survivors who were born in the displaced persons camp, who were born much earlier on, feel a greater sense of a connection to what had happened than maybe those who grew up in more privileged kinds of circumstances and say, well, what does this have to do with me? You know, I'm going to go on and, you know, and play golf. Sorry. Right. Okay. So I've got another question here from Bettina Kaplan, who's asking, how do you ask survivors to talk if they are reluctant? Well, one of the ways in which you begin to ask survivors is that you don't talk about the Holocaust. You begin to talk about, uh, you know, take a map and say, gee, where were you born? Uh, go to the uh, Jewish Encyclopedia. So there are memorial books from some of the towns that people came from. Read that book and then say, you know, and ask more simple, simple kinds of questions about their life and their childhood. Don't just think that survivors have to talk about, um, about being uh, in the Holocaust, you know, begin, the Holocaust survivors had a life before, during, and after. And so eventually, you know, let's say if you have a grandchild who's being bar mitzvah, you can say, oh, gee, did, you know, did you have a bar mitzvah? You know, or what was it like for girls when they turned 12 in, in, in Europe at that time? So these kinds of little things, you know, oh, what, what did they make in your family for, uh, for Pesach? You know, did you make matzo balls? Or, you know, begin asking questions that don't necessarily have to do with the persecution. And then you will see that one thing will lead to another. And of course, often third generation uh, opens up the conversation when they have got to do um, projects for schools and, and it's so much easier for grandparents to talk about their grandchildren than to talk to their own children. Very good point. Absolutely. So sometimes you can co-opt your children to talk to, to, to your parents, and that might be a way to, to begin. Or many, uh, many children, third generation, fourth generation, these days in fourth grade, fifth grade, uh, have to do, have to pick somebody in the family that they admire, and they begin asking the survivor, grandparent, great-grandparent question, and that's another way to begin to get into the, into the discussion. Great. So we've got a, we've got a topical question here from Tommy. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pronounce his surname. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Does second gen have a tougher time dealing with the COVID shutdown? Well, I would in, say in, that the, go ahead, Gabby. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that in the UK, uh, there have actually been two major threats to uh, second generations. And the first one was Brexit. And that sends alarm bells ringing. And, uh, and then now, uh, with COVID, um, that, that has made it particularly bad that uh, they really feel, quite, many feel quite insecure. They, they have taken it differently. And yet there are also those who say, well, we have lived with uh, hard experiences all our lives. Those who uh, felt very close to their parents and who felt that they had almost lived through the parents' experiences. And uh, because of that, we've always really prepared ourselves for calamity. So you get different responses on it. On the one hand, 
the second generation is uh, maybe could maybe be said to be more resilient uh, than uh, their non uh, survivor if non second generation peers and on the other hand there there may be a vulnerability and i think it's too early to actually uh, you know say anything definite on it interestingly enough there, there was a study uh, in israel i believe and um, second generation there compared as second generation to here as well compared the COVID experience of self-isolation with what their uh, parents uh, had to go through and the first generation says oh it doesn't compare with our experiences all uh, during the holocaust and for the second generation um, you know their their thoughts uh, are going there and they associate it with, with that. And I wanted to, um, I, I wanted to say that um, the first reaction of uh, many of the second generation, there were two reactions of the second generation. One is, you know, I'm going to stock up food and I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to have everything I need because who knows how long this is going to last. And the other reaction was, uh, I'm going to get strength from what my parents went through in order to in order to survive this so that they looked at the parents survival as giving them the strength they need to uh to be able to uh go on with it the third generation is very interesting M many of their first responses were what can i do to help and um if anyone's interested i wrote an article about it in uh in, just look at Eva fogelman jewish week new york and uh, you'll get a longer answer. Great, we'll look that up. In fact, somebody's written on the chat if we can send some of these links um, uh, through and I will do my best. Hopefully I can keep the chat and I'll uh, email all participants with the uh, things that have been mentioned. Um, so we have, uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll take one more question because we're just a little bit over time, um, and it's, but it's quite a big one. <laughs> Uh, from Jackie Hops, Hopson, who, which is, how does transgenerational trauma present itself as a problem? Well, all trauma is a problem, but anyway, uh, I'll leave that with you, experts. <laughs> well, I think that we, we have actually referred to uh, many aspects and we could refer to many more ex aspects. Um, because it has been such an all pervasive experience. Um, and just to mention something uh, quite trivial uh, in a way is that second generation in my experience um, tend to read more serious books um, and won't, uh, you know, they, they feel that they, they have to spend their life meaningfully, they have to achieve and if they uh, feel that they don't meet their parents' expectations, then uh, they so often feel inadequate. And uh, there's a project in Holland um, which was uh, conceived by a sociologist, uh, Vanya Kruijer, who um, said there's so many second generation who are overachievers, who've done amazingly well, and yet there's also a group of underachievers, and there's a relatively a uh, smaller group than we would expect of, of the gray area in between. And, uh, and she said, who's looking after the second generation who um, haven't uh, got married, who are not in a long-term relationship and who have lost their parents now, they may be retired and they are on their own. And, uh, and who's go going to look after them when they get old. And so they, she conceived a project which is called Villa Musselstein, and they, um, she, she, the the first one I think is sort of ready. Um, it's a housing project whereby uh, people move into social housing, and uh, there are uh, facilities nearby for them to attend. Uh, like uh, there's one in Amsterdam next to the uh, Reform Congregation, so that there is a social group for them social facilities right on the spot and they have the opportunity to form a kind of family with others uh, of similar background. I would like to, I would like to add to that um, 
there's a lot of misinformation about post-traumatic stress disorder and the second generation. So that children of Holocaust survivors do not have post-traumatic stress disorder. They did not go through a trauma. There were those children of survivors who experienced their own trauma. And here I'm talking about uh, children, second generation who lived in Hungary in 1956, who had to cross the border in the middle of the night with you know, people following them. I'm talking about some of those who lived in the Eastern Bloc uh, who experienced a lot of anti-Semitism. Those individuals, second generation, experienced trauma. The others did not. So what's happened is that everybody now is saying, you know, that the trauma, that children of survivors have PTSD. They don't have PTSD. They have something, they have something else. The other thing about children of Holocaust survivors is that the research that is done on very large groups of people, I'm talking in the thousands, uh, and that there was a very good study that was done in, uh, in Montreal by, uh, by Siegel and Winfield. There was a wonderful study that was done in Israel by Zahava Solomon. Those studies show that, um, and, and an early very wonderful study done in uh, University of Minnesota, by, uh, by Leon, those studies show that children of Holocaust survivors are not more depressed, are not more anxious, don't have more psychosis, more uh, borderline personalities, more um, uh, obsessive compulsive disorders. Uh, I think what Gabi said is right, that children of survivors tend to lean more towards depressing subjects, but that does not make you clinical depressed. And I think that this is what we have to, what we have to understand. I do think, as I mentioned earlier, that what makes children of Holocaust survivors different is that indeed in their part of their development, they go through a mourning process. And, um, and if one gets stuck in the feeling stage of mourning, where, you know, you are constantly identifying as a victim, uh, put yourself into a situation where you're a victim. Uh, if um, if you are, you know, continuously angry, any of those feelings in the in the feeling stage of mourning, if you're stuck in those, uh, then that could have psychological difficulties. And through therapy, if you understand why you are, you know, over identifying with the victimization and rather seeing the Jews as people who had both uh, tremendous strength, even during that time, that could help you get over uh, that sense of uh, victimization that, uh, that is inhibiting you from having a, uh, a fuller, more productive, uh, more productive life. But I think we have to think of, you know, we, we tend to think about just the, you know, what are the problems? Well, it's not necessarily a problem to be a child of, Holocaust survivors. We have to think about, you know, some of the, the strength that we got from people who were able to endure such suffering and come out and uh, embrace life and get married and have children. And, and that's why we are all here. Lovely. Okay. I think that's a good place to, um, to, to finish the discussion for today. So um, I have managed to save the chat. Uh, I need to tidy up a bit, and I will um, send some of the uh, the suggestions. Um, I know a few people have written books, and they're running groups and everything. And I'll and I'll try to send as much of it as possible to to our participants. But first, I want to thank our speakers, um, Gabby and Eva. Thank you very much for your input, you're getting some silent uh, clapping there, <laughs> which you can't oh. hear. But um, I'll send you the chat and everybody, I mean, is extremely grateful. It, it's like, thank you, I'm not alone. Thank you, Deborah, for making it all happen. And uh, Gabby, it was great to have a conversation despite our part. And I hope that next year we'll be able to do it in person in London. Yes, or in New York. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, thank you too, and, and thank you, Deborah, yeah. and the AJR again. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Okay, well, we'll leave it there then, everybody. Have a nice evening, morning, evening, night, wherever you are. <laughs>
and uh, we've got lots more events so do uh, do check out uh, on our website what events we've got coming up okay and we will say goodbye bye bye